Hello everyone. Uh, so we are back uh, with the day two, second half, very first panel discussion. So we have uh, speakers uh, from uh, Unconventional Capital, Catalyst Fund, and Adenian Lab. So we have with us Esther Deti, who is the investment lead at Unconventional Capital, Aaron Fu, who is head of growth at Catalyst Fund, and the co-founder of Adenian Labs. So they'll be talking more about their invest, uh, their outlook on corporate startup engagements. So the session will be moderated by Mr. Ajay. Um, so over to you, Ajay. And just hide myself. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jagruti, for the introduction. How could you, how could one have a conference talking about startups and corporates and innovation and not touch upon, guess who, the investors. So here we have uh, three really amazing folks, a uh, couple of them that we have engaged with over the past few weeks and months, and Esther, who's doing some fantastic work with uh, Unconventional Capital. So welcome on board. And let us try and keep this interesting and, and engaging getting an investor's perspective or an investor's outlook on corporate startup engagement. Before we dive into the questions, if we can just quickly go around the room introducing ourselves. Maybe you can start with Esther, move on to Aaron, and then with Irene, the organization you represent and what you do. Over to you, Esther. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Esther, as you've heard. Uh, Esther Detti. I work with Unconventional Capital. Um, we call ourselves ANCAP for short. Um, we invest, um, you know, early stage ticket sizes uh, across four countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Nigeria. And I'm investment lead um, at ANCOP. Um, hi, guys. Great to be here. Ajay, long time since we caught up uh, in, I think, I first, I first met Ajay in, in, in Bombay, I think. Yeah, so it's great to see you land in Africa. My name is Aaron Fu. I'm, I'm the head of growth at the Catalyst Fund. Catalyst Fund invests uh, in fintech across uh, emerging markets, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. We backed 54 companies since we began. Our companies have gone on to raise more than $260 million since then. Um, I'm also GP at Shopper Ventures, which we launched in December last year. Uh, we focus on pre-seed Africa only. Uh, we've made about 11 investments since we began. Uh, and ticket sizes range from 50k to 100k. I'm sorry, Catalyst Fund, we target 250k uh, in terms of our ticket sizes. Um, great to be here. Awesome. Irene. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting. Um, my name is Irene Kiria. I'm a co-founder and chief growth officer at Adenian Labs. Adenian Labs is a venture studio, and we invest in a smart technology, um, impact-driven companies that can be scaled across Africa. We're headquartered in Kenya and have a presence in Zambia, Tanzania, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, and the UK. And uh, we invest, um, we come in as a pre-seed investor at 80,000 to 125,000 125k um, investment, and we take equity in those in, in those companies. But our model is we work with that company for 12 months and capacitate them with um, every resource that they need. So we provide a corporate structure for startups, you know, to ensure that we de-risk their level of failure. So from helping them build um, a solid technology to building a team around them to giving them access to all the technical functions from HR, legal finance and go to market strategies and launch them in our ecosystems and um, scale them if the idea makes sense in all the markets um, where we are. So given that we're a venture studio, we uh, leverage on a shared economy, shared capacity and uh, shared consumers. To date, we have invested in 15 companies and uh, in the next month, we're doing another call for startups to take in five more from each of the five markets that we are where we are, but our mission is to build 300 um, companies in the next five years. Great, uh, that's that's phenomenal. Uh, early stage investments definitely is, is the is the way forward and three of you doing doing that and capacitating and, and building out that ecosystem and then carrying it on to the next stage is, is awesome. So uh, Aaron, I'll come to you with my, my first question, uh, which is more to do with, I mean, you've been around in this part of the world for about a decade now with wearing different hats and different capacities. How have you seen the, the corporate innovation landscape uh, in East Africa and Africa kind of uh, evolve? And are corporates looking to engage with the external innovation ecosystem in order to be agile and, and innovative in 
continuing to hold on to the market share and, and scale up. Uh, thanks, thanks, Arjun, for letting me letting me kick off. Um, I think that's a very like nuanced question, but I can give a like a quick brief overview, right? Like, I think you know, working together as startups has not been new to to corporates in East Africa at all, right? I feel like we've been through like different waves. I think almost every single like major bank and telco has experimented with various kinds of startup partnership mechanisms, whether they are running accelerators, incubators in house, whether they're doing sort of like bespoke engagements. A few have even run sort of like their own venture funds whether publicly or not. Um, and I think you've been able to see like some successes from it. Um, I think mm -hmm. some corporates have also sort of like been burnt through this process and actually have invested a lot of money to like not a lot of sustainable results. You know, a common sort of like thing we always hear is like, you know, um, engaging with them is great, POCs are great, but how often do POCs translate into sustainable long-term products that actually impact our PL, right? So, so I think mm -hmm. sort of like balancing that enthusiasm with sort of like real outcomes is sort of like where that journey is going. Um, I mean, I don't need to tell you that and we do a lot of work in, in India as well, whereby, you know, a lot of banks have actually really evolved and changed their thinking, right? I think what we're looking, what I'm personally looking forward to corporates in, in East Africa doing is evolving and changing their thinking over time and not just sort of like throwing away something and starting a new thing over and over again. Um, we do a lot of work with banks in Nigeria, as an example. At the Gallus Fund, we have a circle of corporate innovators, which involves six banks in Nigeria right now. And all of them are actively looking to, to engage with, with startups as well. Everything from sort of like, you know, one-off engagement, something more structured, creating sandboxes. I think the appetite is still there. I think like it's what we need to see now is actual real results from it. So, sorry, long answer, Ajay. No, no, thank you. Thank you for that and, and setting the, the ball rolling. And I'll come to you, Irene, with this because some of the conversations that we have had where you also spoke about the open innovation or the or the co-creation model. Uh, any any light that you would want to shed on the ways in which some of the conversations that you have had with corporations in terms of their view of uh, external innovation, the co-innovation, uh, partnering with startups. What is your take on it from uh, a Danian Labs perspective? Now, we um, are seeing a lot of uh, interest from our corporates in uh, participating uh, in the innovation space. And uh, we have seen corporates try to put up their own innovation centers, especially with uh, financial within the financial space, you know, banks. And they've come up with quite amazing products, but not by themselves. You know, they've had to work with other uh, people in the ecosystem to create some of these solutions. But um, I think they're also learning to appreciate, you know, the fact that some of these innovations have to be done outside their um, in-house verticals, yeah? So um, that notion where we, we saw a lot of it happen in the last five years, where um, industries, industry leaders are setting up their own hubs is not as effective. So now they're partnering with, uh, with, with innovation, existing innovation apps so that they can bring value addition into their startups. And these new business models, you know, we've seen how they work. They work really well with um, telecoms. They work really well with uh, banks. And, you know, other corporations are also adopting some of these things. For example, at Adanian Labs, um, we had an opportunity to um, build a solution for uh, the climate fund. And out of that solution, you know, it made so much sense to see how we can create an AI driven engine that will allow for them to fund and, and, and go through uh, KYC and documentations that they receive from thousands of um, corporations so they can make smart decisions. And it made sense that we can actually build a startup around it and, 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 and launch that uh, within other um, industries. And, and that type of um, um, it, integration is happening a lot. We call it in creating intentional startups um, with corporates where they have a problem and instead of paying a supplier, you know, how can we build a startup and we create a team and build the whole innovation so that they come in as a day one client, but we're also to sell that solution to um, other people in the industry. So it, it is taking shape and I, that is exactly what we, we are championing, you know, creating a shared economy model where we bring in corporates, you know, because they're, they're industry champions. And, you know, if you're able to throw a startup solution in an existing uh, corporate structure, you know, you take that uh, solution from base, you know, from zero to hero in a very short amount of, uh, of time. And this gives the corporates a new business model, you know, that 
um, is completely separate from their existing business and, and it's where uh, the world is evolving towards. So um, we're seeing a lot of that happening. We're having such conversations. We, it's easier to, to have action from entrepreneurial driven corporates as opposed to uh, multinationals that have to take some of this uh, information to their board and you know so because they're quite big ships but uh, we, we believe that it's only a matter of time before they also are able to um, to, to, to join um, the band program. Very cool thank you thank you so much Irene for for the deep dive. Esther is there something that you want to, to add to this particular question or no okay cool. So we'll just, uh, I'll just take it to the next one and I'll come to you, Esther, uh, as a first one. Uh, I mean, as a, as a pure play uh, investor, uh, we spoke about how and where the, the corporate angle comes in, plugging into startups and the startup ecosystem. According to you, what are the areas or industries that are most ripe for disruption in a startup way? And I'm talking again from an enterprise world or a corporate world perspective. Uh, and why? Is it important for you as, as an investor, whether you look at it from a validation perspective or if you were to look at it as a proof of concept or whatever, what are the industries that you would keep your eyes open on? Well, I think the, the good news is that Africa remains um, enormously fertile ground for entrepreneurs. So, you know, our population is young, it's growing, you know, internet penetration is rising fast. And there, you know, all these tremendous opportunities for innovators to use technology to improve access to education, healthcare, financial services, and energy. So for us, those four sectors, those four areas are where, you know, disruption continues to happen and remains to stay ripe. We see a lot of investments and a lot of, um, you know, startups coming out in the financial services um, sector. And, you know, sometimes people think it's over-invested in, but there's so much potential and there's still a big wide open gap. And I'm sure Aaron can speak more around this, you know, moving away from mobile payments to mobile um, money transfers into payments and lending. But then, you know, it, there's so much more that's being, you know, innovated as we come, as we move along. The financial inclusion is just one of those spaces that has boundless opportunities um, given sort of like the nascency of 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 um, of the of the continent in terms of access um, to this finance, so those are the sectors that you know we keep an eye on per per um, personally, um, but also keeping an eye also on the pervasive structural barriers um, at the same time. So you know we still have complex and inconsistent regulations. We have a fragmented marketplace of fifty four countries. Um, we have you know. Scarce capital, although we are talking about how we are investing in the in, in, across the continent, but you know, there should, I, I personally think there needs to be more investments in early stage businesses, so we can just have more of those businesses grow into zebra status and then more, more into unicorn status as well. Um, so you know, I, I think there's uh, boundless opportunities. Corporates also lead. Um, African corporates who lead uh, big businesses in these sectors, and I know you know would benefit um, tremendously from various partnerships or just engaging with startups and uh, and innovations in these sectors as well. No, well, thank you, thank you, Esther, for for that one. Irene, I'll I'll come to you. I mean, uh, we have spoken a couple of times this this past week. I mean, if you look at themes like AI and blockchain and some of the emerging technology areas that that you guys are are working in. And because you are a kind of a, a multi-pronged model yourself at Adenian, whether you look at it as a venture builder, the, the co-creation model, accelerating startups, uh, investing, it's kind of, you're kind of uh, plugging several holes there. Uh, when it comes to this entire corporate piece, how and where would you position it within the, the Adenian model and why is it uh, important for you to have corporates plugged into the business model that you run or you champion? Um, thank you. So um, the, the, the coppers can come in at different levels of our um, model. So at the ideation level, they can come in as partners so that when we do a call for startups, we can run uh, focused, um, sector focused um, um, startups uh, who are solving some of the um, challenges that they have. That way we are able to support demand driven solutions. So um, that is at, at phase one. At phase two, you know, if that startup or if that solution makes 
a solid business case for them and it will help them solve their issue, they can come in as pre-seed investors to ensure that, you know, uh, that product is built and then provide support um, internally so that as that solution is being built, they are mentoring and training and adding value um, during the process of um, technology development uh, into the process of onboarding the solution uh, within their, 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 their structures. And um, at the end, when the, the startup is, is, is registered, it has a solution, they then come in as um, a client uh, that can now scale that solution uh, within their ecosystem, whether it's in one market or multiple markets at the Rhining silos. And um, I think for us to truly say we are successful in uh, building uh, tech startups or accelerating tech startups in Africa, we cannot work without um, the, the, the corporates. They, they, they are the biggest B in the B2B model and uh, they already have a lot of uh, resources and tools that can add a lot of value to, uh, to startups and that's why a lot of them are failing. You build a solution, but you know, your go to market is a challenge because you know, it's very expensive to run a B2C model, especially because a lot of training has to take place. One of our startups, for example, um, Ecoba, which is a solution, a FinTech solution that is built to support uh, savings groups. We all know over 80% of the African population is uh, underbanked or outside the bank, formal banking structure. And this model of communities coming together, saving and lending to each other is what's really sustained um, this informal economy that is not formally banned. Yeah, so uh, we, the, the ECOBA has built a solution to, 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 to uh, digitize this economy, but it requires a lot of education. And this, you know, so the, the um, cost of acquisition is very high where you meet the group, you train the group, you, you know, but um, we realize if we partner with telecoms or we partner with banks or we partner with payment gateways that already you know have this economy and systems and we come in as value addition for them and their value addition for us we will um, accelerate um, our go-to-market which is exactly what we're doing in, in Kenya, we are, we, are, we, are, we are partnering with a bank and a telecom in Tanzania, we're partnering with a payment gateway. In Nigeria also, we're partnering with a payment gateway. So, so that way, um, we, we, we are able to bring value to them and they bring value to us. So co-sharing that value and co-creating that value is where I see um, there's a massive opportunity for corporates, there's a massive opportunities for also investors, you know, when you're investing in a company, how do you bring in that corporate um, infrastructure that can add value into uh, whatever solution or startup you're, you're, you're investing in. That is the way that we see we'll be able to build, we call them camels, they're called um, um, unicorns. <laughs> but for us, our mission is, yes, it will be great to have unicorns, but if we can build resilient startups and resilient entrepreneurs who can sustain African economies for years, you know, um, they can employ and they can create jobs and, and, and bring value and, and, and last for 50 years, 100 years, that will be a success factor. Great. I mean, we're mentioning unicorns, zebras, uh, read, in, read <laughs> fairly recently an article on why it's important to be a camel to, to cross the desert, which is the COVID. And the ones which operated like a camel were the ones who actually kind of made it and they were able to maneuver. But uh, Aaron, I'll come to you with the next question because you're in, in a kind of a vantage position in, in several ways because uh, with the time that you've spent in the region and you've seen how the, the market has evolved, but even currently, whether it's wearing the Sherpa Ventures hat or the, the more corporate BFA Global hat that you that you wear, and also the work that uh, BFA has been doing in, in the region, building out those uh, corporate partnerships. Of course, you see value in that, not, not from the capital standpoint, yes, that's an add-on, but also becoming the customers and validation and, and whatnot. So how, how are you seeing enablers playing an active role in, in enabling this, this corporate startup uh, partnerships in, in Africa? Um, yeah, sure. I, I think I think before I can like enable specifically, I think it's really important for us to draw a delineation between like partnerships and sales, right? Mm. Because because I I think like 
true co-creation is one thing where it's it's a product that's like built from scratch that, that it's really sort of like built together and there's also sales that there are a lot of startups whose business models require large corporations banks telcos fmcgs to buy services from them right whether that's buying data buying distribution like buying their services essentially right so so i, I think it's sometimes like it gets muddled right where you know you say you're working wanting to work in a partnership with a bank but really you want to sell to a bank right and i think that delineation is really 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 important um i think like enablers have like a very huge role to play when it comes to facilitating the conversations right because i think as all of us in the room have seen that like sometimes the the language that startups speak and the language that like corporate speak like just really isn't there i think over the years, you've seen a lot more cross-pollination. Like there are a lot of individuals who used to work in startups who are now product leads at sort of larger institutions. Um, mm -hmm. There are lots of people who used to be in larger institutions who have now come out and started their own company and very often are selling back to the institution um, that they used to work for as well. So you're, you're beginning to see a little bit of that. But, 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 but by and large, like how they measure success, what's important to them, how they manage their budgets, like all of that is very, very different, right? So I, I think enablers have a huge role to play when it comes to bridging those conversations, um, when it comes to bridging understanding as well, and, and just really sort of like bringing the, the community together, right? Um, I, I think also from a discoverability standpoint, right? Like there are very few large organizations where there are dedicated roles, where someone is meant to go out and find partnerships or find startups to work with, right? Very often, like this is buried in KPI number five, number six, in between sort of needing to run marketing, needing to run product, needing to run tech, right? So it's never a high priority. I think enablers have a role to play to like make that KPI number five easier and easier to do so that even with minimal effort they're able to bring in the right companies to showcase to their board um, to really try and like build those partnerships right um, and i think finally what i'll also say and i know that you know irene is doing a great job doing this as well is like preparing the companies to like have those conversations with corporates right like i i think there's nothing more disappointing than an internal champion wanting to bring a startup and that startup comes to the board and is completely unprepared from a demo and material and, and backing sort of side of things. Someone needs to do that heavy lifting um, and enablers have a huge role to play with regards to that. As investors, we have a role to play as well. But, you know, very often, you know, that role is also like paired up with, with enablers as well. So I'll, I'll pause that. I don't want to give long, long winded answers. No, great. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, okay. you, you go, go ahead. I mean. so, so the challenge, the challenge that we have seen is investors are investing and enablers are working on like there's that there's not enough um, interoperability in terms of functions and support, yeah. So, so, so then investors are complaining that you know there's issues with startups and enablers are complaining, you know. So, so I, I think there's a huge opportunity to also yeah, work together and and investors' role to extend uh, somewhat, or, you know, where as you're investing, you're either partnering or pairing with uh, an enabler. Uh, company to 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 facilitate and 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 to de-risk um, the investment and to ensure that the success rate of that startup is also higher. Just something I wanted to add. Esther, anything to add on that one? I think I think Irene and Aaron have covered sort of like the investor and um, enabler perspective. I think one of the voices we're not hearing here, and maybe this is because I previously wore an advocacy hat up to what two months ago, really is we're not sort of like hearing the role of government here. So, and, and I'm sorry, maybe it's just the DNA of my background, really. I think government should offer financial incentives and issue mandates for corporations to work um, with startups and to collaborate and not just startups. Um, we've seen this in different parts of the world. And so we should see this in Africa as well. Um, but they should also, so, you know, Aaron talks about sort of like selling data and all of this. Um, but they should, governments should come in and mitigate the risks arising from collaboration, um, such collaborations, because you know we need clear and strong protections of IP and that data. Um, if you talk to startups and you talk to them about collaborating with um, corporates, what do they start thinking about? My idea will be stolen. <laughs> this is normally the first worry, really. So if we had some clear, you know, strong protections around the loss of this, you know, it would be really good. And then lastly, just. She see government doing more to improve regulatory and in the investment um, 
environment for startups. Um, we have, you know, <laughs> I mentioned this earlier, com complex and inconsistent uh, regulations um, coming up all the time. So for as long as we don't have an enabling environment, you know, investors will keep doing what they do. Um, all these other champions and enablers will do what they do. But then, you know, there will be something falling in the middle. And I feel like that middle gap might be the role of government here. And also, I just wanted to make a quick note on, you know, I really like seeing what is happening across the countries, you know, the developing of innovation hubs, um, you know, what's happening in Rwanda, in Morocco, in Ghana. I think this will amplify partnerships and that cooperation between corporates and startups, um, but also draw talent and hopefully even more um, investments into these businesses. Absolutely. I think I, just want to quickly double tap on Esther's yeah. point, like, you know, be, before we even get to incentive, the one request I have from government is really just to get out of the way, right? Like, very often, what I hear, like, banks say is that we can't work with this startup because this technology hasn't met certain standards which the government has set, right? Like, because we are CBK regulated, because we are CBN regulated, like, whatever it is, we need to hit certain, like, security requirements, certain data protection requirements, like all that kind of stuff, right? Which startups find it very expensive to meet. And very often that is end up getting pointed to in terms of like why things aren't working together. So I think before we get into incentives, let's talk about like regulations that make it easier for even non-incentivized situations where the commercial case is already strong um, for, for them to work together. I didn't anything on, on that. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we have an interesting case study uh, with one of our startups in Tanzania, Fema Agri, um, whose um, entire concept is on how they can crowdfund for the agri space. And uh, th that means blended finance from institutions and individuals who are looking uh, for investment opportunities. And they did a pilot last year and... Uh, 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 for three farms, you know, through the crowdfunding model, and the fund could not continue because crowdfunding uh, in Tanzania was, you know, and in between the brackets of uh, pyramid scheme, and then it's illegal. But they spent the last year uh, working with the government of Tanzania, um, the, the, the key authorities, MSA, and two weeks ago they were granted uh, through a sandbox. Um, a the permits uh, to to run this model, which is I did not think you're cutting quite out. amazing and exciting because uh, for the first one, them is very banks don't, uh, but but, but the, it provides a good opportunity for for individuals like you and me to still invest and 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 and, and grow our investment there. So yes, the government has to let innovation take place, and where they are not sure, just create these infrastructures where they can monitor and learn and evolve as opposed to bring out the illegal cut. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Irene, Aaron, and, and Esther. Uh, with that, I'll come to the, the last uh, sequenced question on this. And then probably if you have time, we'll take a, a couple from the audience. So partnerships, CVCs, acquisitions, What's the way that you see corporate partner, corporate startup partnerships uh, heading towards? Um, Aaron, if we can start with you. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I honestly feel like the most the most straightforward way is really just commercial partnerships, right? Where it's it's either the the corporate pays the startup for like access to their their channels or like their customer base or their products. Or the startup is able to provide a product which the corporate can then white label and then distribute to their own customers and there's some sort of like revenue share in there. Like the simplest of mechanisms like work the best. I'm I, I'm not entirely confident that most corporates in the short term will be able to build like strong internal CVC functions. That takes a lot of like capacity building and commitment. Right. And, and I think very few of them like understand the magnitude of that task. Right. We see launches of like million dollar funds, five million dollar funds by like large corporates. And that really doesn't you know, move the needle by by any means. Right. So so I think that's something that I'm a little bit worried about. I wish I see more of that. I think the other thing that founders need to bear in mind as well is that if your business model is selling to multiple corporates, do you really want to let one of them in on your cap table as a major investor? Would that not like turn away like other potential clients as well? So I think like 
you know, being able to be the right kind of corporate partner, even if you're investing, um, it, you know, is really, really, really important, right? You, we've seen many cases go wrong where, you know, a large corporate takes like a big stake of a company, whether that's like 10, 20 percent, uh, and that actually inhibits like further growth. However, even, even at the Catalyst Fund, we've seen acquisitions work very well, especially earlier on, right? We usually see them sort of like pre-series A, pre-series B. Um, Mobilize is a great example of this. It's a micro-insurance startup in South Africa. Standard Bank bought them, I think, after two to three years of working together. Um, they went from a 20% stake to a 40% stake to, you know, a, a, full, a full buyout. And so they were able to use that technology to, you know, to reach um, vast audiences for micro-insurance in a much cheaper manner. So I think if you get a strategic investor in, make sure you guys both understand sort of like what is the long-term path. Are you going to acquire me or are you going to sit at that, that, that percentage, right? So I, I just wanted to lend that comment on CVC, but I, I, I do think that the primary form of mechanism is really just going to be like simple commercial partnerships. I think that's going to be what, we, what we're going to see the most of. Great, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for, for that one. Esther, if you want to add to that point. Well, I guess, yeah, Aaron what, what's talked, the direction that you see a lot of the corporate startup partnerships uh, heading towards? Well, it's, you know, partnership, the partnership model is already well established in fintech, for instance, uh, of the major African fintechs, you know, Ghana's Jumo, Egypt's Fori, um, Nigeria's Interswitch, most are allied with larger corporations, you know, with banks and telcos. So I see the partnership models already, you know, well established and is a way to sort of like uh, lean on and Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Aaron, can you hear me? <laughs> we hear you great, Ajay. What about me? Can you hear me? <laughs> I hear Esther great too. Uh, it's kind <laughs> okay. of uh, broken. I uh, wasn't sure if it's at our end. Ajay, I All think right, you're back. Man. All good. All right. So anyway, so I was just saying the partnership model is well established and that's something we can lean on and grow on. And just as Aaron has said. So yeah, so strategic partnerships with the startups, you know, but also maybe nurturing startups via direct investments as well um from this um, and, and not really cvc but just you know to see if we can have like like what safaricom is doing with their spark fund for instance i think that's interesting to see if we can have more of those around um and just more you know what i haven't seen is seeing uh corporates launching their own startups um i think that would be interesting to see as well um some interrupts <laughs> sorry I said that's cool. what we're trying to to build as well at Danian Labs. Cool. Oh, really? And, and I need to to wrap up the conversation. If you can you can add to that. Uh, no, I think um, like like Esther and Aaron said, um, it's we've seen those models work. We know what it entails. Uh, it, it's just a matter of replicate replicating them across industries. How can uh, health startups? partner with FAMCOs and, and, and chains of hospitals and, and all of that. But um, yes, enablers like ourselves, what we're trying to do at Adenian Labs are, are, are championing some of those things. Uh, somebody mentioned on the comment session that you know a lot of entrepreneurs who have run successful businesses are now funding other uh, entrepreneurs, which means they understand the nuances and, and what it takes. You know, So it will change. And uh, it's just an exciting time um, to see all these changes happening in Africa. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you for, for those remarks, uh, Irene, Aaron, and, and Esther. Maybe if we have time, we'll just look up if there are questions or a question or two. Um, OK, so we have someone for Edwin, Edwin from Bunihab in, in Tanzania. Which model works better for public owned innovation hubs to secure partnerships with corporates and investments? Which model works better for public owned innovation hubs to secure partnerships with corporates and investments? I'm not really sure what the question is, but I do want to say that if you're publicly owned, it also means you have direct links to the government, in which case maybe your role is to communicate <laughs> what regulatory changes need to happen in order to facilitate more of this, right? Um, yeah, you can you have a great role in terms of like convening roundtables around this, um, making sure that any startup that passes through you is like regulated or vetted in some way, because I think you being publicly owned with the stamp you give to a startup 
at least because you're proxy government, that could really help that, that partnership clause a lot. So I think finding your niche there and, and being a conduit to the government could be a, a good specialization. But I'm not sure I understand the question. And Sorry, Sarah, you want to Yeah, go for it, Irene. And, and also um, hard to have uh, enable to enable enable relationships, you know, should be promoted in instances like that where you have a public um, owned hub and a, a government entity bringing other um, hubs that are in the private sector and explore models where you can work together. I I, I would like to see an you know um, an integration of, of hubs, you know, working towards supporting a group of specific startups, for example, and what that could mean, because I have noticed that, yes, there's a lot of hubs and there's a lot of support and, you know, the people focus on their niches, but they're not working together as, um, as a, a bigger uh, support mechanism. So it will be interesting to see that happen as well and, and what it could do to the startup economy. Great, thank you. Thank you, Irene, for that one. Um, let me see one more question. Jagasti, do you have any questions here? Yeah, we do have. Um, is there any kind of interest for some kind of investments for creative technology disrupting education or manufacturing. This has come from some lead artist. <laughs> That's why it's so creative. <laughs> so investment for creative technology startups? Anyone who would like to take that? I can, I can go for it. So like I said, we're on a mission to build 300 startups in Africa in the next five years. And uh, if we are to do even half of that, it means we'll touch a lot of the different sectors, you know, even if we're to look at the SDG sectors, we will be able to create a solution for most of those. And the creative industry is booming. Uh, one of our startups at Adenian Labs is an animation company called Ada Animation. And uh, we have seen such amazing interest, not just in the local industry, but also internationally, where, you know, the uh, thirst for content is, is not enough. You know, Ada Animation has raised seed funding from a an African uh, venture capital um, company, Platform Capital. They have partnered with Hollywood animators, you know, to run uh, capacity building product, uh, programs for uh, African animators. And actually a team of these Hollywood um, animators, you know, some of them worked in, in big platforms like Lord of the Rings are coming in November so that they can explore how to build infrastructure, whether it's a studio in East Africa or across Africa. But so we are seeing a massive opportunity uh, for the creatives and, and all those other sectors that were not really regarded as investable in an African perspective. And, um, you know, th there's a massive issue of capacity building, you know, building capacity to ensure that, you know, such sectors also receive the attention that they need and they have the capabilities needed, but also capacity building across industries, local industries, because Africa um, economies are built um, on a foundation that is very static and, and favorable towards certain industries. But there's massive opportunity in the creatives, in fashion, in, you know, and uh, we want to explore all of that. So, yes, there is. And uh, please check out our website. And uh, we're doing a call for startups officially starting Monday. So I'm hoping to see all these amazing ideas applying so that we can start our incubation in January in Tanzania, Zambia, Nigeria, Kenya and uh, Uganda. <laughs> I just want to double tap and say that, like, I think the global appetite for like the creative economy is is huge. I think whether that's you're talking about US, Europe, or Africa, I, I think one thing is that the creative economy also represents the new economy, right? Like it's accessible, people consume content that's like generated like by individuals directly as well. Like it's getting incredibly dis disintermediated. And I think like the creative economy is like a definite in, in, like an investment focus for Africa as well. I think education as models, we've seen a few that have tried. It's a very difficult model to really get right from a venture scale perspective. It's just so expensive like to run, right? Very often it's like, every additional like customer or someone you bring on needs like 
um, a, a lot more infrastructure to be able to handle. So I haven't really seen a lot of strong education models uh, in, in the tech space in Africa just yet, but I hope to see them. Uh, on the manufacturing side, I, I think the real question is like, who is the buyer, right? Like are manufacturers and people that run these facilities ready and able to absorb the technology that you are building, right? Or like, you know, are you already running factories yourself, right? Like whatever it is. So I think the customer side of things and the manufacturing side is probably the, the hardest thing that, that I would I would worry about there. But yeah, uh, lots of appetite for all those things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking those questions, Esther, Aaron, and, and Irene. Jagruti, over to you. Yeah, so thank you so much, panelists. I think it was a very interesting conversation. As I can see, the whole Q&A section is filled up with different questions. Uh, so thank you so much for joining. I hope you enjoyed the session too. So yeah, look forward to it. Bye. Thanks bye, so much, guys. guys. Ciao. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.